Okay, this is Ken Griggs, and we're talking about Phoenix, and we are on, I think, the fourth lecture uh, on Phoenix? Okay, so right now what we want to do, hopefully we've captured your imagination when it comes to uh, understanding um, particles uh, um, and uh, understanding particle structures through networks. Um, I do want to identify something, I, one more thing before we go on to the mathematics uh, behind it. The thing I'd like to identify is what we would generally call the photon. So this, this electromagnetic structure, um, like the other entities in Phoenix where we can literally create an object, create a particle, as a complete graph or as a graph that, uh, that is uh, in and of itself. That is, all of the vertices uh, are connected to other vertices, uh, and then on each, each vertex has three of something. But they're all connected in such a way that they're, they don't need another vertex to be connected to. Everything is a single graphical object, or they form a single graphical object. That's what defines a particle. And this is also, by the way, one of the reasons why a structure like the up quark, this thing, is not a particle. This is why you never see this thing existing in nature on its own, because it requires another vertex in order to exist. That's what we call the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force dictates to us that these particles, these hadrons, are bound together in such a unique way, or in such a, a way, that if you try to tear them apart, they form new particles. Whether those new particles are also hadrons, or hadrons and leptons, or whatever they are, they form new particles. So, uh, and that's demonstrated by this vertex requiring another vertex to be attached to. Uh, and the same thing, for example, with the uh, down quark, um, this system, let me get it here, huh. with a, a down quark requiring that it be connected two ways. Either it's connected to a single vertex two times over, uh, or it's connected to two different vertices, as in the case of the proton. And so that's, again, held together by this edge, which is literally functioning as the strong nuclear force that we are so familiar with in QCD. So, in our theory, the strong nuclear force comes about because these vertices re require uh, a three connections per vertex. And so, vertices can be connected to other vertices, and those connections, etc., 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 form a very strong link. Um, now, the um, particle that I wanted to talk with you about before getting into the math is um, this particle that is formed from a structure that we saw in the first, I believe the first or the second video. But it's, a, it's an energy structure. Um, and I identified it as an energy structure. This is one variant of it. Okay. But basically it's a vertex that's connected to something else. It's not, it has no tadpoles. We call those, the loops and the arrows are called tadpoles. They're where the vertex eats itself, you might say. It's connected to itself, but this doesn't have that. This vertex is always connected to another vertex. Um, so if we put two of these together, then what we find is we get a structure that magically, or not so magically, because this is math. Everything that I'm showing you right now is actually based on math. And we're going to go through in the next lecture uh, and, and, and show that. But what we've constructed with two of those structures, or what we can construct, is something that looks like this. So it's got two vertices, but those vertices are connected each with an edge three times over. This, my friends, is a photon. Now, why is this such a beautiful quantity? It's got so many beautiful things to it. But one of the reasons why it's a beautiful quantity is because if we had associator, as we try to associate um, charge 
with how many loops and arrows are sitting on a vertex, the first thing we notice about this is this doesn't have any loops or arrows. So this entity has no charge, which is, of course, how we think about a photon. It is a chargeless particle. Hmm. The next thing that we associate with a photon is the idea that a photon can be formed from a particle and an antiparticle. And lo and behold, hmm, again, this isn't magic. This is actually math. But lo and behold, the math that's associated with this structure actually allows you to create, it actually can become, it can decay, as we would say, it can decay into these two structures that we've already identified. Remember these two structures? Okay. Well, the first structure, the one with three loops, is what we identified as the electron. The second structure, we know because we've already identified it, but it also meets our, our criteria for what I'm about to say, is identified with the anti-electron. It is a positron, the antimatter version of the electron. So that would be the positron. Right? So what we find is that this signature thing up here, this thing we're identifying as the photon, really does decay into what we call an electron and a positron. That's a beautiful thing. Okay? Now, what we find is that there is such a beautiful system of structures in this theory that when you use the, um, the vertices like this that are all um, that have no self connections to them and when you use them to form these types of particles that these types of particles have a wonderful wonderful thing to them um, what they have is that they all will have decays into something and it's anti-something. So, for example, in the case of a proton, let's say, let's just ratchet it up. So if we have a proton, I'm just going to draw it out here. The proton has three vertices and each vertex has its loop structure. So we have our U, D, and U. That's what the proton looked like. And then if we add to it, it's antiparticle, and all that is is it looks identical to the proton, except we've now um, we've now replaced all the loops with arrows, so that we have an anti U, an anti D, and an anti U. Okay, that's what that stuff is over here. So that's the proton here, and this is its antiproton here. So I'm just going to name them below. Proton an antiproton. Okay? In this theory, these two things can come together and form a six vertex system. Okay? I'm going to draw it uh, so that it kind of looks like a um, kind of looks like a hexagram. But again, I, my artistry right now on the spot ain't so good. So, so that's what it looks like when it when um, uh, when they they unite and form a photon. That's a photon. Now notice that each one of the vertices of this photon has no loops and has no arrows. All of them have three of something on them, but those three edges actually uh, always go to another uh, to another vertex. So in this case, let's say here, we've got this vertex, which has the three uh, something. This, this vertex is connected, so it's got three, rather, three. It's connected to this vertex. It's connected to this vertex down here. You see my hand-eye coordination sucks. And it's connected to this vertex up here. Um, so they're all neutral vertices. So this is a photon, and when we look at the math of it, this photon, yes, decays into the proton and the antiproton. So we can always form a pro. Uh, we can always form antimatter, and the antimatter can always and will always interact with its matter to form these photonic structures. That's a beautiful thing. 
Now, another thing about these photonic structures is uh, something um, that I've always considered highly incredible. Um, we can discuss something called mass and energy, rest mass and relativistic energy. Now, in relativity theory, essentially all particles, or in, in particle theory, uh, or at least in the standard model of particle theory, all particles um, have rest mass. Um, all uh, leptons, all um, uh, quarks, all, um, all particles. Uh, the only things that don't have it are the photonic or force structures. So the photon doesn't have any rest mass. The, um, the gluons do. Um, so technically, but this is the reason why in, 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 um, in the standard model, the gluons have rest mass, the rest mass, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I take that back. Now, the gluons don't have rest mass. Please delete that from the file. I just had a little brain uh, part there. But, um, but the idea is that there are two types of masses going on uh, in, uh, from relativity theory in modern particle theory. And the two types of masses are rest mass and relativistic mass. So there are particles like the photon which do not have rest mass. That's really what I'm trying to get to. <laughs> okay, so if we look at the structure that we've created, um, these structures, one might ask, okay, how can I associate a concept of mass with this structure? Now, what I'm about to present is partial. It doesn't fully describe what mass is, but it qualifies why mass is, okay? And why some things have it and some things don't. But it doesn't fully quantify it. We'll get back, we'll get to that later on. So the idea here is an idea called diffusion. So diffusion is basically how information flows uh, on a network. Um, and in our case, one can ask the question, how does information flow at this vertex? Well, certainly what we see is that some of the information leaves the vertex. It goes somewhere else. Whereas some of the information actually sits on the vertex. Okay, It flows and it flows. It literally uh, um, uh, forms a tadpole uh, on the vertex. So we could easily say that if we had one bit of information, or rather, if we had three bits of information sitting on this vertex, then probabilistically, one-third of that information is always leaking somewhere else, and two-thirds of that information is always sitting there. Okay? So in this case, two-thirds of the information sits, one-third leaves. In the electron's case, all the information stays on the vertex. In the, um, in the uh, d quarks case, we have uh, one-third of the information that stays on the vertex, whereas two-thirds of the information can go somewhere else. And in the photonic case, where we have a vertex that always gives up its information, um, we would basically say that uh, three-thirds of the information is always leaving, zero information stays on that vertex. And so this is the the idea behind relativistic mass versus rest mass. Rest mass comes about when information sits on a vertex. So in order for something in this theory, qualitatively speaking, to have rest mass, it has to have loops and arrows. Conversely, in order for something in this theory to have no rest mass whatsoever, all of the information must always be traveling. It cannot be sitting on any vertex, ever. And so when we get back to the question of uh, a photon, we find that it meets the criteria that we've just laid out, the qualitative criteria, that all of the information sitting at any particular vertex is always leaving that vertex. So technically speaking, this whole system here literally is on the move. It's always moving. Okay, the information on this system never sits on a vertex. So this system has no rest mass. 
it has mass, it has energy, but it has no rest mass. Okay? And it's the same thing with the photon that we had created in this situation, where it also doesn't have any rest mass. None of the information is sitting anywhere, whereas these two chunks do. Because information is sitting here because of the arrows, it's literally connected back to the vertex. And information is sitting here because of the loops, it's literally connected back to the vertex. So I did want to point out that photonics is really very apparent in this theory. And one more a aspect of the photonic uh, nature of it is that the information is always on the go. So we should expect that if we can define what the momentum is and what the energy is and define how particles actually move in this theory, then we should well expect to see that when we're talking about a photon, we will find that the particle is not only moving, but it's moving at the fastest rate that any particle can move in this theory. And that's a beautiful thing. And then we will find, and, and that's coming about because information is always on the go on a photon. It's never sitting any, on any vertex. It's always moving. So it has, there has to be a maximal motion or flow for, for, those, uh, for that information. And we'll find out that that's exactly what happens for all photons. There is a maximal speed that that photon defines, whereas all of the other speeds, all of the other momenta, uh, are always less than the momenta, that maximal momenta defined by the photon. So again, that's, that's where we come up with, wow, this really does seem to be working out. I swear to you, it really does work. So um, let's now proceed on to a little bit of the uh, core mathematics uh, that uh, enable Phoenix to, to truly be the firebird that it is.